it's snowing outside. <laughs> Hello everyone. Today I want to talk about dogs, wolves, and human evolution, which is kind of an umbrella term for I saw a post on Instagram about wolf-dog hybrids and I feel the need to address this in the context of their evolutionary history, in particular with humans. So let's just dive right in. So let me start off by saying that I'm not an expert. I don't hold any certification in biology, zoology, evolutionary biology, ecology, any of the fields of that. But I have studied it at the undergraduate level because for like a year I thought I was going to be <laughs> a wildlife biologist and then changed my mind. I also have been studying animals for my whole life just for fun because I'm passionate about them. I find them fascinating and you know by the time I was seven I was correcting my first grade teachers on animal facts because that's how much of a nerd I am. <laughs> so I'm gonna try to make this a little bit more casual both for my sanity and to make it easier to digest for you all. To start off let's talk about the beginning like when did wolves and dogs kind of split like when did dogs happen because there is this idea that humans like cavemen went out into the wild and started domesticating wolves to become dogs, which is not true. That's not how it happened. And oftentimes that has been in reference to food, so like livestock and that kind of stuff. So yeah, in those cases, humans are going out and like selectively breeding for traits. Generally, that is what domestication is. But with dogs, it's a different story because dogs were the first ones to be domesticated. So you may be wondering then if humans, if cavemen, didn't go out and start selectively breeding and domesticating wolves, then how did it happen? The general consensus is that wolves domesticated themselves. The bolder ones started scavenging closer to human populations, and those are the ones that became proto-dog, which is sort of the link between wolves and dogs as we know it. So that's what um, anthropologists and evolutionary biologists call that link is proto-dog, so like the first dog basically, which happened around 36,000 years ago, so <laughs> while the Neanderthals were still alive. So generally this is what biologists call the divergence of wolf types. So the first group with proto-dog is the anthropogenic type, and then the non-anthropogenic type remained gray wolves. That's why we still have wolves out there. They didn't all become dogs. And because domestication and evolution, it doesn't happen all at once. This is a very gradual thing that's happening. So it's hard to say, this is wolves, this is proto-dog, this is dog. You know, it, it's not cut and dry that way. But roughly 34,000 years ago to 15,000 years ago is like the period where we say proto-dog happened, was existent. And then around 15,000 years ago is when people, people, scientists agree that domestication of dogs occurred. So the first wave of domestication of wolves was on their end, not ours. And then after that is when people started being like, hey, you know what, this could be, this could be advantageous for us. And then they started selecting for certain traits in the wolves to become their companions or their hunting um, aids, <laughs> which is um, a theory that is rather Interesting. I don't know how popular it is these days, but there's a book called The Invaders by Pat Shipman, and her theory is that because humans were using proto-dog uh, to aid them in hunting, they were more successful than their Neanderthal counterparts who were not using proto-dog. So then around 6,000 years ago, we have more intensive domestication of proto-dog. Now we're starting to get into like breeds, you know, um, and in the Roman period, you have like different breeds for guard dogs, different breeds for shepherds, different breeds for lap dogs. So that is when this started really happening. So that's the general timeline for the domestication of wolves into dogs that we see just to keep it really simple. Uh, next, I wanna talk about the domestication syndrome just a little bit. I don't wanna to get too sciencey, but it is um, important to this discussion. So the domestication syndrome in short is 
all of the changes that occur as a result of artificially selecting for traits. Um, so generally speaking, we've got natural selection, which is determined by the environment, the natural factors in a particular habitat. Basically, individuals that have favorable features within their environments are more likely to survive and produce offspring. Whereas artificial selection is humans actively changing the genetics of a species or an individual or whatever to suit their own needs. It's also very important to note that a domesticated species is not the same as a tame or habituated animal. So raccoons that are more friendly and won't get closer to people or those who have, you know, like pet squirrels <laughs> or even like tame elephants, those are not domesticated species. Those are just habituated animals. Maybe they were bred in captivity, but that doesn't mean that they're domesticated. The, a domesticated species undergoes the domestication syndrome, which I'll get into now. Of the roughly 55,000 species on the planet, humans have only been able to successfully domesticate about 39 species, most of which are mammals. So there are particular traits that decide, you know, is this animal going to be a good candidate. Um, generally speaking, the paramount feature that determines whether or not a species can be successfully domesticated is the ability to be tame, <laughs> just tameness in general. It is an endocrine trait. And as we have seen with dogs in particular, changes at the endocrine level affect a lot of physiological changes, like the changes you can see on the body of the animal. So some examples of these are uh, variable coloration, like patches, think dairy cows, paint horses, shepherd dogs, that kind of thing. So patchy coloration rather than uniform. Smaller body size overall, usually the wild counterpart of whatever domesticated species is larger than the domesticated version. Another trait that's pretty interesting that is a result of endocrine changes are floppy ears and curly tails. And not just in dogs. If you look at pigs, for example, domesticated pigs tend to have floppy ears and really curly tails. It's kind of their trademarks. But if you look at the wild counterparts, it's not like that. So when you see like Labradors or Huskies or whatever, you see these traits come up again and again. And that's not because at first anyway, that's not because humans are breeding for those traits. That's because those are results of the domestication syndrome. So the point of bringing up artificial selection and the domestication syndrome is to just show all of these changes that are happening with wolves to become dogs. Like they are technically the same species. Canis lupus are wolves. Canis lupus familiaris are dogs. And they're the same species, and they're considered the same species, I guess I should say, because they can produce viable offspring. Wolves, wild wolves, and domestic dogs can still reproduce, and their offspring can continue to reproduce as well. Which is where we get wolf-dog hybrids. So now I come to the whole reason I decided to make this video, which was an Instagram post by a wolf-dog hybrid owner. And a lot of the comments were people asking about what it's like to have a wolf dog. Should I get one? Are they hard to train? That kind of stuff. So if you're just interested in wolf dog hybrids, you might Google them. And what I've discovered in a brief Google search, just putting in wolf dog hybrids, one of the first results I get is from wolf.org. <laughs> so let's read just a little bit of their page on wolf dog hybrids. So they talk about what a wolf-dog hybrid is, which is part wolf and part dog, and they do share some similarities in behavior and physicality, which is true, obviously. Then they go on to say, Wolves are wild animals, and they are shaped by evolutionary pressures that allow them to find food, keep themselves safe, and produce offspring. The genetics that they express in the environments they live in allow them to survive without the help of humans and they have a citation, which I approve of. <laughs> Dogs evolved from wolves through a centuries-long process of domestication. 
Domestication is the process by which a wild animal adapts to living with humans by being selectively bred by humans over thousands of years. So, as we've already been through, this is kind of right. I think they're trying to simplify it just to make it easier to read. Side note, there was a, an experiment done with domestication of red foxes in Russia that began in the 50s. And what that experiment showed is that domestication can happen in just a few generations of the animals, not of people. They were able to successfully domesticate red foxes, which I'm not going to lie, I have a problem with, I think, just because we can do something doesn't mean we should. That's kind of my motto when it comes to anything related to science and technology and that kind of stuff. But I don't want to get too much into that. So it doesn't have to take thousands of years for it to technically be domestication. But the, the important thing about the wolf-dog hybrids is that dogs have evolved with us for thousands of years. They have co-evolved with us, which means that they have particular traits in their behavior that wolves don't, for example. So it's been shown through behavioral studies of dogs and wolves that dogs recognize and read facial expressions of humans. So and it's like, I think it's the left side that shows emotion or something like that. So they are looking at the left side of the human face to determine um, emotions and stuff like that. Wolves don't do that. Wolves don't care <laughs> because they haven't co-evolved with us. Similarly, dogs understand what pointing means. Like if you point to something on the floor, a dog will look. Not all dogs, I mean, you could try it with your own if you want to, but in these studies, the dogs will look because they understand what pointing means, which is something that is so small, and yet wolves don't understand that, that motion. They don't, like, even after training and stuff, it's been shown that wolves do not recognize that. So these are just little examples of how different these animals really are to one another with regard to humans. And this is really why I have some serious issues with the breeding, the selling, and the buying of wolf-dog hybrids. Because it's not just an ethical dilemma, because it is. It's one of those things where it's like, should we be doing it? Uh, I don't know. I mean, you can make an argument for both sides. I, I am very cautious about that kind of stuff, but it's not just an ethical dilemma. It is a safety one <laughs> because wolves do not behave the same way dogs do. There has been too much time between them that it's not like a wolf-dog hybrid is going to behave like a husky or a German Shepherd, even if it's part that. And, and the other thing with these dogs, wolf dogs, with these hybrids, is that they are not always the same percentage of wolf to dog. Like, the ratios of their genetic makeup are not consistent. So, in some parts of the United States, for example, depending on how much wolf is in the hybrid can make it so that it is considered an exotic pet, which has a whole other legal um, implication to it. One of the things that they have a big quote on their website, wolf.org, um, that says, People who own hybrids often find that their pet's behavior makes it a challenge to care for. The diversity of genetic composition, even within one litter of hybrid pups, leads to a wide range of appearances and behavior patterns among all hybrids, thus making their behavior inconsistent and more difficult to predict. So, I mean, first of all, I'm just like, why risk it? You know, I don't understand why people aren't satisfied with just dogs and cats. Like, why do you have to 
get these weird exotic pets. I, I, I suspect it comes from a place of wanting to feel cool, somehow elite, somehow more connected to nature maybe. But I'm just like, why not just get a dog? <laughs> like you will be happy with a dog. Why do you have to risk it and, and, and get these animals that are unpredictable? And there have been cases where they attack their owners because hello, they're part wild animal. <laughs> like it's not just, oh, call of the wild, you know, like it, it's, it's a serious thing. Hi, it's future me, and while I was editing this video, I realized that I forgot to mention two very important points. Firstly, that wolf-dog hybrids do kill people, and they have in the past. One notable case was in 1996 in Colorado, where a woman was killed by two wolf-dog hybrids in front of her two young sons, who did try to uh, shoot the animals with a BB gun, but obviously that wouldn't do very much, um, but she died. And what they found in the stomachs of the hybrids was human flesh, so they did also eat some of her. Uh, additionally, those two individual animals, one male, one female, were both about 25% larger than their wild counterparts. So that's my second point, is that hybrids often are quite a bit larger than the wild version of whatever it is. The final paragraph on wolf-dog hybrids on wolf.org says, Every year, thousands of pet wolves or hybrids are abandoned, rescued, or euthanized because people purchase an animal they were not prepared to care for. So that's a whole other ethical implication or issue in and of itself. Yeah, it's like people buying rabbits for Easter and then realizing, oh, this is actually like a whole responsibility that I didn't realize and then they abandoned them. On a different website that I got on that original wolf-dog hybrids Google search is a pdsa.org.uk and what they say about wolf-dogs is wolf-dogs have been growing in popularity in recent years and many people might like the idea of owning one but do not know what they're getting into. Wolf dogs are usually created by breeding a wolf with a German Shepherd, Husky, or similar breeds uh, of domestic dog. But owning a wolf dog isn't like owning a Husky or German Shepherd. They are much more challenging animals that aren't really meant to be pets. Thank you! Okay, so that paragraph alone should just warn anybody off of getting one because I can see how somebody who works with wolves, say at a wolf sanctuary or some kind of rehabilitation center or whatever, um, doing research, they might be more equipped to handle one of these. Say they acquired one because somebody was giving them away or someone bought one and then realized that it's a lot of work so they want to pawn it off on someone. Like there are situations where people can acquire these animals without having contributed to this sketchy market for them. But yeah, the average person, even the average dog owner, is not equipped to deal with this animal. There is a fly. Further along in the PDSA page about wolf dogs, they say, the body language of wolves can be quite different to that of domestic dogs, and they don't react to people in the same ways. Wolf dogs are less inclined to think of humans as friendly or to try to please them compared to normal dogs. So without an experienced handler, there is a real risk of aggression or injury as well. If you've ever seen, and if you haven't, I recommend checking out some YouTube videos of um, wolves hunting. But they look playful when they're taking down big prey. They, uh, there, there are some several videos on YouTube from different documentary series about um, wolves. Uh, and uh, when they're surrounding a bison or an elk or whatever, when they finally picked one and they removed it from the herd or whatever, they look very playful. Like the, their behavior, their body language is very much how you would expect a dog or several dogs in a dog park to be playing with one another. But overall, the point is that the behavior of wolves and the behavior of dogs is vastly different, even though they look similar, they are technically the same species, but because of that 30-ish thousand years that humans spent 
evolving with dogs as companions, as cooperative beings, that makes a huge difference in whether or not an animal is a good pet. Although wolf-dog hybrid might seem like a really cool idea, it's not the same as just another breed of dog. And I would strongly advise against getting one. Well, I get that people who want exotic pets, people who are dead set on a wolf-dog hybrid are gonna do it regardless of what anybody says. That's what inspired me to make the video, but I just wanted to talk about, okay, there's this thing that affects us today in society, on social media, whatever. It exists today, but what's the history of it? The history of it is that we have evolved with dogs for a really, really long time. And that's why there's that saying that they're man's best friend, because they have been since we were cave people, which is really cool and kind of cute. And that's what makes them such great companions for us because they want to cooperate with us. They want to please us. We are like interspecies friends <laughs> with dogs. So that's what's most remarkable, I think. And I, I don't think many people realize quite how long dogs have been around, which is why, you know, even the idea of having a wolf or a, a wolf dog as a pet just boggles my mind because there's not enough time there. Maybe, maybe down the line that would make sense, but the miracle of dogs is that um, they, they started it, you know? We didn't start it. <laughs> we finished it, I suppose you could say. A lot of this information is taken from my years of learning about wolves <laughs> and dogs, uh, but specifically from a anthropology course that I took in 2018. There, there's a lot within this subject and uh, related subjects that I could go into, but uh, I just wanted to keep it a little bit bite-sized, uh, talk about the history of the domestication of dogs, a little bit about the domestication syndrome because it's really interesting for starters, but also it's relevant because it shows that there are significant differences between wolves and dogs, even though they're the same species. And then a bit about the wolf-dog hybrid thing because I am, I'm very passionate, if you couldn't tell, <laughs> about the subject. And I just think, you know, get a dog. Go to your animal shelter, get a dog. They're great. You will be happy with them. So thank you for watching until the end, if you made it this far. I'd be really interested to know your thoughts on these subjects in the comments below because there's a lot to unpack here and I'm always up for discussions on subjects like uh, history, evolution, animals because those are my passions. So yeah, and uh, until next time. Mm -hmm.